great Scott. The Great Scott Show. And as they head into the final furlong, all of the other radio stations and radio hosts are left in the wake of a keen turn of speed by the Great Scott Show, the champion. With Scott Prather. Steal the show. Welcome in to the 8 o'clock hour of the Great Scott Show. I am joined now by Jay Walker, voice of the Raging Cajuns, former host of Bird's Eye View and co-host of the Sports Gap, friend of mine, and, uh, you know, a man that, along with myself, we proudly created. Terrible Tune Tuesday. That is correct. How you feeling? It's good to be home for a week. You're not on the road for a week. I leave tomorrow. Going Maybe. to Hattiesburg. But I mean, you were you were home for like I was. I was home actually week. for two weeks. Two weeks. Yeah. And um, so I'll I'll leave for Hattiesburg tomorrow. We'll get home late Saturday night for Troy, and then next Wednesday at uh, five o'clock in the morning, I'll meet the softball team over at Lampson Park, and we'll head to. Clearwater, Florida, where we'll spend eight days together watching some of the best softball in America. Ooh, I was talking to Coach Glasgow about that last week. I was like, Coach, man, you uh, you just didn't decide to take a little light on the schedule, huh? And he, I, I, what I love is how open Coach is about like all of his decisions. He's like, well, you know, we we feel like if we go into this thing early and we play well. We could possibly host a regional or a super regional. And if we if we don't, he's like, if we don't play great or if we play okay but, you know, lose some games, it might change how I approach the rest of the season. But ultimately, it's going to make us better because we'll be better battle tested. We'll be better than if we had played somebody that, you know, wasn't very good. So he said the one downside is, you know, I know our, our fans don't get to see as many of those games at home. He's like, you know, in – we're working on that to have more matchups in the future at home. But he said, outside of that, there's no downside to it. That's his whole viewpoint. And and I think he, you know, everything he does is 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 for a reason. And uh, that I won't even say murderers row because it's it's an extremely difficult early schedule. But the Cajuns are a very good team. I mean, it's not it's not like they're an FCS football team that is, you know, going right. to play, you know, at, at Ohio State. It's not like that at all. They're going to compete and they're going to, you know, win some games. And uh, and I think they will. That, you know, d- interesting this year, um, of course, the Cajuns do host the Sunbelt Conference Tournament uh, mm-hmm. at Lamson Park. But during the regular season, they got 22 at home, 34 away from home. Baseball has 34 at home and 22 away from home. The the schedule's just the opposite. You excited for baseball season? I am. I uh, I enjoyed um, going out to Fan Day on uh, Saturday. And Julian Brock was hitting some back home to Texas, huh? He was he was great in the home run derby. You know that that this isn't like the home run derby in Major League Baseball. You know if you get if you get on a roll, hit a few of them out, that's pretty good. And he hit ten of them in his uh, in his second round and. It, you know, it, it started to feel like the way you feel when you watch it on television. It was pretty cool. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, how about the environment Saturday night? It's great. It was great. I, uh, when was the last time you, the Cajun was popping like that for a men's basketball game? You know, I, the last time they had a crowd that big was a, a game against ULM the year that they won 26 or 27, whatever it was. Oh, it was the senior night game that they lost? No, no, no. That was against uh, Little Rock. Okay, okay. Um, but okay. I think I think you know, to get that kind of atmosphere, I think you got to go back farther than that. You know, I, I'm th- I'm thinking more like the days, uh, the early days of, of of Bob Marlin's tenure when you know you'd play late in the year in a conference game, whether it was Denver or Western Kentucky or whoever, and and they'd be getting after it. I think you got to almost go back to that 
at for his first year, you know, they started out a little slow and then went on a great run. And I remember by the end of that season, yeah, the dome was slamming, man. <laughs> Got off to a slow. Yeah, they were three and thirteen, Scott. <laughs> and then they and then they started rolling, and they and, did. and everyone sort of you know got on board. Uh, you know, I remember some heated matchups with Georgia State when they came to the dome, and the atmosphere the atmosphere was good. You know, with Ryan Harrow and those guys, but it was not like it was on Saturday. That wasn't as much about the matchup as it was. We just want to see this team play. We want that sense of nostalgia, obviously, with the Cajun chicken. But, you know, it was their 20th win of the season, and we're here in early February. You know, I thought, and I've always maintained, atmosphere begins with your students. And all year long, the students have responded pretty well when school's been in. And I want to give Coach Marlin and his staff credit for that because – they all personally went onto campus and talked to the, the Greeks and, and talked to other folks and said, the guys, we need you. And they, and they responded. And they, Sam DiMuzio, that name doesn't mean a whole lot to most people. As a matter of fact, I don't think it means anything to you. Um, but he is the director of marketing and promotions at UL. Did he make that, that sheet? Yes. Okay. I saw his name about that sheet earlier this week. So, you know, he's he's got the sheet sitting there on, on the... Uh, tell the, tell the listeners that don't know what the sheet well, was. Well, the, the sheet had a little bit about the opponent and a couple of the players, but it also said, okay, when they miss a free throw, this is what we're going to do. Uh, when they, uh, you know, when they f- uh, fumble the ball and it goes out of bounds, this is what we're going to do. And as a result, you had a lot of participation and everything was kind of together. And so kudos to Sam and his staff uh, for that. Also, Coach Marlin, those red dot T-shirts, yeah, he ordered those. Uh, And they've ordered more for the next home game against ULM next week. When I say they, I mean the marketing department at UL. Um, You know, they had the chicken T-shirts. The chicken was there, of course. You know, knew it was going to be received great. But... You can get into shape like Russell, <laughs> but the but the atmosphere started with that student section and with the band and the spirit, hit, and then it permeated throughout the rest of the crowd. Yeah, and uh, it was it was good. It was it was well put together. Um, Here's an email. And it was fun from, uh, from Doug. He says, "Guys, I'm a little younger. I don't know the origin of the red dots. Could you explain?" And that goes back to Blackham Coliseum. Um, there were some shirts. That they that they had made and and Dan maybe could tell you what was supposed to be on the shirts, but at any rate there was a misprint, and so they couldn't sell them. So they just made this big red dot over the mistakes that they made, and they started handing them out in the student section, and they would bring um, the students. They wore them to every game, and. Back then, the students were seated in some bleachers behind the benches um, because there was a lot of room between the benches and the actual stands at Blackham. And uh, they would all wear the red dots. They were rowdy as hell. They all got newspapers. And when it was time to introduce the other team's lineup, the red dots would open their newspapers and, and pretend to read. And then when it was time to do the Cajuns, they'd crumple up the newspapers and throw them. And um, and and do that. By the way, you can't do that at the Cajun Dome. And it was written out on the form, like, yeah, don't don't throw, don't crumble it up and throw it. Just just put it down. Yep. Um, no, it was cool. It was a great atmosphere, and it was a great win. I mean, this matchup against Southern Miss Thursday, you, I, I could use words to 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 build it up, but I really don't need to. I mean, look at the records, look at the standings, look look at the success on the court. I mean, Southern Miss hasn't lost since they lost to the Cajuns. Louisiana's won 10 in a row. And whoever, you know, they both have a two-game lead over everyone else. You get sole possession of first place. I, you, you're, you're in prime position when the tournament rolls around. This is, this is a huge matchup. Well, the, th- the reason this is such a reward game for the Cajuns, you win the game, you've got a one-game lead in the standings. But you have a de facto two-game lead because you swept the season series. Mm-hmm. So if there's a tie, you get the tiebreaker. 
You're they, officially up a game and a half. They've already got the tiebreaker against Marshall if Marshall gets into that mix. Now, they still have to go to James Madison, who's the fourth team in that conglomerate. Um, this is going to be the first time, geez, maybe in the 2023 calendar year, that the Cajuns are underdogs going into the game on Thursday. Now, the line hasn't come out yet, but I'm telling you, Southern Miss is going to be favored. Probably by a couple points. Um, you know, the Cajuns were a point and a half favorite against yeah. Marshall the yeah. other night. But Southern Miss is going to be favored in that game. Like the Cajuns, they have not lost at home this year. <laughs> and, you know, that's a team that won seven games last year and lost the 26 or something like that. And so winning over there is very new to them. They haven't they haven't done well since Larry Eustacey was the was the head coach there. So um so the fans are are they're excited in Hattiesburg. Um gonna be a nice crowd there, and the Cajuns will be underdogs on Thursday. Um we'll we'll see if they can overcome all of that. If you're down, if you lose, you still got a lot of ball left to be played, but man, if you win, it's like you said. You have the tiebreakers, so you're basically up a game and a half in first place. Uh, and then you're up three games on, on everyone else. That's I, I say everyone else, three or more on everyone else. It's it's big time, man. And, you know, when it, when it comes to the Sun Belt Conference Tournament, everyone says, you know, get a top four seed, get a top four seed. The difference between one and four, how big of a difference do you think that, how big of a how do I put it? The difference between four and five, I think, is perhaps a bigger gap than one and four as far as advantage goes. But how big is the advantage between one and four? Well, here's the advantage. If you're one, you're guaranteed postseason play. If you go into the conference sure. tournament as the one seed, okay. you are guaranteed at minimum a bid to the NIT. So that's that's the prize. Um you know, one would still play four in the semifinals. Um, and if you're the four, you'd wear the visitors' jerseys, but you'd still play each other. But, it, but no, but if you're one, you're going to play basketball after the tournament is over with, guaranteed. And you're the only ones that can say that. Yeah. Jay Walker in studio. It's the great Scott Show, 1033 The Goat, simulcast on 1420. Um, Got a lot of messages about uh, my humps, my humps, my humps, my mm-hmm. humps, my humps. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people just saying it still makes me laugh every time. Uh, Jay emailed, I was because I said I don't remember when we did that. Uh, frequent listener, he says, it was in 2015 because I was coming from the Mississippi Gulf Coast and it was a rainy day. Had me rolling, LMAO. I'm, um, I don't know how people remember all that stuff. It, it, a moment like that, though, you know, it's, it just might stand out. There are certain moments on these shows that uh, stand out more than others. What's one for you of our time together that stands out? You'd have to give me some time to think about that. Think about it. I'll ask you again in like 30 minutes. But uh, it's been fun, man. 17 hours. I'll hour. tell you one thing that one time that I still think about and laugh. Speaking of thinking about and laugh, let me digress for just a second. Sure. It has never failed to make me laugh out loud. When the chicken came out as the Grim Reaper with uh, three minutes and 40 seconds left, I laughed out loud. And there's something about that black hood with the chicken face that just cracks me up every time. And the ominous, like, uh, you know, uh, music. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, but no, one of the things. <laughs> I don't know if you were getting ready to get married or had just gotten married. And I referred to your wife as the lizard yeah. on the show. And you went, ah, da, da, Lizzie. And then you found out she was okay with it. And so then you started doing it too. But it was the look on your face the first time I referred to her as the lizard. The lizard. It, it was almost a look of panic like, oh, my God, you just pissed her off. And, and she's going to blame me for it. <laughs> the things that worried me in my 20s that I would just not care about now. 
Yeah, that that she said that um, people have come up to her at one of her jobs this week, and they're like, "Hey, lizard, uh, you know, what's, what's going to happen to the station?" And she's like, "Who are you?" You know, <laughs> a lizard. I, you know, maybe maybe it's because my mom once got mad at you years ago because you were, you were just referring to her as your mommy. And she was like, tell Jay to shut his mouth with that your mommy stuff. <laughs> you're like, you're going to the game with your mommy. Yep. And I was like, my mom, you're like, no, you're mommy. And you, you, you were just, you know, egging me on, which I don't blame you. It was radio, but yeah, she, she did not like that. Yeah. And once I told you that, you stopped doing that. <laughs> Look, you know, I'm not, I'm, uh, I'm not doing anything going to make Patty mad at me. No. Oh. I, I think since then it was always just like. Hearts and flowers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. You know. Um I even I even quit calling you LSP in case she decided she didn't like that. No, no. You you you, you I, I still call you ODB on occasion. But we I think when we were still on like daily, that's what we called each other, but once it became a weekly thing, it's it just doesn't slap the same. It used to be like little Scotty Prathen said. <laughs> And that's before the show became the sports gap. It was bird's eye view back in the day. I would I would hang out with you for two hours and uh yeah, the ODB thing, that just that was a spur of the moment. I called you ODB with full intention of what it actually means. And then you were like, ouch. And on the fly I'm like, no, I just I just opinionated diverse bird man. That's what it that's what I meant. You remember I sent you a photograph of a bar at uh, the the Biscayne Mall in Florida yes. that was called ODBs. Mm-hmm. I think you featured it in one of your old uh, from the Birds Nest. Articles oh, I'm sure. Too. I'm yeah. sure that I'm sure that's true. That, on that trip, we were down to play the Florida schools, and Scott Farmer was um, was on that trip, and we went and saw the Miami Heat, who I, I think were the defending champions uh, at the time, uh, play the Bulls at the uh, American Airlines Arena, which was right across the street from where from we were, where, where the ODB was. That was a, that was a very, uh, very memorable trip. Bet, bet it was, man. I'm sure those tickets were not cheap. How'd y'all get them? Uh, Someone hooked you up. Farmer had a hookup. Yep. Someone hooked you up. Good stuff. Yeah, we, were, we were sitting in the lower bowl in the end zone. But, it, you know... The the public address of Miami Heat, and when he said Heat, they had those things where all the 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 flames started shooting about forty feet high, and we're sitting a good ways away, and it you got felt, warm. Oh felt, yeah, oh you yeah, felt the heat. Man, I was at a uh, reminds me not sports related. My family, when I was a kid, we were on a trip. We'll we'll just say out west in the summertime, kind of. Going out west, I mean, everywhere from Wyoming to Vancouver <laughs> down to it was a, it was a long trip. I was pretty young, maybe seven or eight, and uh, we were in Vancouver for a night. Most of the trip, it was kind of in the the great outdoors, so to speak. And uh, I guess my dad was like, "Man, you know, the kids have been trucking it with us. We're in a city. Let me let me see if we can actually." you know, do something like that you could do in a big city. The The Phantom of the Opera, the Broadway tour, was coming through Vancouver, and the, the Phantom was some guy that was on this old Nickelodeon show, so, like, we kind of knew who he was, and my dad's like, we're not, we're not getting tickets to this. He's like, well, I'll try. My dad has a way of just talking his way into lots of things. I mean, I could tell you stories. And um, he, like, goes up, and he's like, has his cane, and he's... Hey, you know, he, he gives the guy some story about, you know, I got my family, you know, we're tired and we're just, I, 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 don't, I don't know if you have anything, but like, has anyone brought anything back? Like, is there anything available? And the, you know, nice folks of Canada, the guy's like, hey, yeah, actually, believe it or not, someone just came right before you and returned five tickets and it was five of us. And he's like, really? He's like, yeah. Like, you want to buy them? He's like, sure. What, you know, are they in the back? He's like, no, they're on the front row. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I mean, Broadway productions or something, you sit in the front row. And we were, you know, we were young, but we, our parents listen to musicals a lot. And right before intermission, you know, the Phantom starts screaming, 
in some. He's like, no, no, no. And then, boom, there's this giant flame that just comes out from the front of the stage. And that's, you just made me think of it, like the heat. Mm -hmm. You could just feel it out of nowhere. And it's kind of in like a big, dark theater. It was something, man. It was not fake fire. It was not. It was not fake fire. It was a heck of a production, too. And, uh, you know, we had to hear that soundtrack for the rest of the trip uh, and pretty much for the rest of my childhood. But it was uh, it was a moment, man. The heat is on. The heat is on. Glenn Fry. The heat is on. It's correct. Not a terrible tune. I mean, oh, not, no, no, no. It, it's a not. hit. It, it can be a little annoying. Like, I can, I can only take it in doses. You know, I don't know that, like, I would want to hear it. A lot, but you hear it at the right moment. You're like, all right, I can move my hips a little. You know, I, I I agree with that. There are some tunes from the '80s that, when they come on, you always crank it up. And then there there there, there are others. And for me, that song fits in that. You hear it and you say, oh, I haven't heard that in a while. That's nice. My mother's listening. She said, uh, "Thank you for all the memories." Love, Mommy. <laughs> 25 after the hour. Yeah, th- that's that's one of those, like, uh, the heat is on, or like, some like it hot. Some like it hot. Like, oh, it brings you back for a moment, but I don't I don't need, it's not like a so- an old song by like Journey or something. You're like, you know what, I could just listen to this album all day. You know, that, and people are going to say, Jay, really? But there are two songs came on the radio yesterday. And it was a beautiful day, and, you know, I had the sunroof open, um, you know, on the Jeep, and, and it was just, you know. And, uh, and when the songs came on, I cranked them up. One was Murray Head's One Night in Bangkok. Okay. And the other one was The Safety Dance. Is that Weekend Ends if we want to? Yeah. We can later on Which has been behind. played it on has. Terrible Tune Tuesday by was. you, because I never would have done that. That was, that was early on, and that was a Steve Wiley uh, suggestion. Which, looking back, I, it, it wasn't one of my better choices. No. It wasn't one of my better choices. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, we've, we've had some misses. Mm-hmm. We've had some hits. I think there's one song that, that I played once that it just, it's the one that, that gets brought up the most when somebody, I meet someone and they're like, man, like Terrible Tune Tuesday, and they, they start singing this song. We'll play it for you next. The Great Scott Show. I'm Scott. That's Jay on a Tuesday, 1033 The Goat. Simulcast on 1420. It's The Goat, the greatest sports talk of all time. We don't talk trash. There is no team in the National Football League right now more balanced than the Dallas Cowboys. We chew it up and spit it back out. Uh... 1033 The Goat. Let's play ball, it's game day. We want strikeouts, base hits, double plays. Take the field, hear the roar of the crowd. Come on, Marlins, make us proud. Come on, Marlins, make us proud. Keep hoping and You know, Mac, you know, we have played a couple of Creed songs on Terrible Tune Tuesday. But my first exposure to Creed was that. Really? Okay. <laughs> and, and so as a result, you know, uh, Creed songs are, oh, no, terrible. Yes. And, and I, as you know, on my Facebook page, I've done several countdowns, my favorite oh, yeah. songs from the, well, I'm doing the 2000s right now. And, uh, but there are two things. There's no Creed and no Nickelback ever. If, if, if there was going to be a Creed song, now, it'd be this one. Oh, absolutely. For those that don't know the backstory, the former owner of the Florida Marlins thought that... Bear in mind, this was like... Creed had had their moment, and at this point in time, we're kind of a, a running joke. And he he still loved them, and he's like, Scott Staff, will you... Could you create a theme song? We think it'll help really fire the team up and get people in the stands. They're the Marlins, and the song is called Marlins Will Soar. Marlins swim. They don't fly, for those that don't know. 
They're aquatic. Um, but just the way that he, Scott Stapp, I'll say, creeds it up, it's, let's play ball, it's game day. Yeah, that's great. That's great stuff. Now, that's not the song um, that I was referencing earlier. There's, you know, we, we've played so many awful songs on Terrible Tune Tuesday. Uh, I laugh back thinking that, you know, after eight years, people thought we'd run out of songs. Never. Um, well, there was one that, uh, you know, it just, it's the one that I, I I hear sung to me the most by listeners. Shoot, I, I hear it sung by you. Mm-hmm. So I figured we don't need to come up with new ones. It's the last day. Let's just, uh, that you and I are on together. Let's just, let's just play one memorable, terrible tune. And, and, I, and, and, I, and I knew right away what it was. And what is it, Jay? It's Liquor and Whores on Terrible Tune Tuesday. Liquor and Whores Liquor and Whores The cigarettes and dope and mustard and bologna Liquor and Whores I was down, I drank in at the Legion, and I met a girl, she was nice, she was pretty and pleasing, she said, hey boy, we should do some Mary, and I said, sure, but before we do, there's something that you should know. I like liquor and whores Liquor and whores Cigarettes and dope and mustard and bologna Liquor and up well it does some folks thought it was going to be no 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 and and while that one you know that one still gets played at russo park but that's not when i see people out and they bring up terrible tune tuesday they they start singing liquor and whores Uh uh-huh like i didn't know anything about that show i didn't know where the song came from i didn't know when i played it that day jay that it would have such a lasting impact you get mad when we have terrible tune tuesday and i don't just play it coming out of a break you're like how did you not even play a clip of it today I know. Would you say it's your favorite terrible tune? Yeah. Uh, it's been Sacred fun. Boom, boom, dope. boom. Now let me hear you say, Wayho. Wayho. We got, we got that one, too. All right. Hall of Famer, Kathy May 15. That is correct. We're going to take another time out. We'll come back. Jay and I will uh, chat for one more segment, get his thoughts on the Super Bowl, if he even cares. We'll even watch it, or will he just watch halftime? It's all coming your way. Don't go anywhere. Great Scott show continues right after this. 
If it wasn't for goats, we wouldn't have coffee. Look it up. I'm gonna get some coffee. You want some coffee? No, thank you. I'm fine. And the best sports talk in Acadiana. 1033 The Goat. <laughs> One of the worst songs of all time. Yes. Agadoo by Black Lace. Welcome back into the Great Scott Show on a Tuesday. Jay Walker in studio. Tomorrow on the Great Scott Show, limited commercial interruption. I've got Super Bowl week. I love to bring on players that played in Super Bowls. Got Brandon Stokely, got Jake DeLone, and Thomas Morstead. Friends of mine, friends of the program will all be on the show tomorrow. Uh, Don't miss it. Tune in. It's going to be a lot of fun. Cool. This year's Super Bowl, Jay, where's where's your interest level for Eagles-Chiefs? It's, I don't know, about a three and a half, I guess. Yeah. You know, look, I, I can't root against the Chiefs. Because my mom would come down from heaven and beat me up. She loved Patrick Mahomes. Ah, she loved Patrick Mahomes. Um, had Cincinnati won, I wouldn't even be watching. Not at Arrested in Rihanna with the halftime show. Okay. Um, because it's going to be hard to beat the Snoop Dogg, Dr. Dre, Mary J. Blige from last year. And it's not even going to come close to Gaga. Um but it was, and, and you and I talked about this before the AFC championship game and all this stuff about Burrowhead and, and the mayor of Cincinnati saying that Mahomes need to go get a paternity test because Joe Burrow's his daddy. And, and I told you how Joe Burrow is really starting to turn me off because he was so damn cocky. And so uh, I was... I still like Joe Burrow. I was really rooting for Kansas City in that game. Made for a spicy matchup. Yes, it did. And, um, but if, if, if Cincinnati had won, I wouldn't even turn TV on. Come on. I'd go find something else to do. Come on. You're that, that it, you're that passionate about this? Well, I, and, and I can't stand the Eagles. Okay. There's nothing about the Eagles that gets me excited. Why, 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 why can you not stand them? I, I just never liked them. Okay. Um, you know, I, I sort of liked them a little bit when Andy Reid was there. Um, the year that they won the Super Bowl, I appreciated them because Doug Peterson was their coach. Nick Foles. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I, you know. I I think, like, I don't have a strong rooting interest. I suppose I like, the, I, you know, I like the Chiefs more than I like the Eagles, perhaps. Like, you know, good fan. I have some friends that live in Kansas City, as do you. You know, good fan base. And, um, you know, Mahomes is, is likable, but... I kind of rode the Eagles for a while and, you know, a month ago when they were struggling, I was like, everybody's sleeping on the Eagles. Like, they're they're the one seed, they're going to get healthy, and they're going to go to the Super Bowl, and they're going to win. So I'm, I'm kind of just riding that wave because I do, they, you know, they were a one seed in 2017, and they were counted out, you know, with the backup. And uh, I remember when the Saints were, were the one seed the year they won the Super Bowl, I was like, oh, well, they... You know, they lost three games in a row, and they're going in. Yeah, you know, I, I don't think they can do it. And I, I think everybody makes a big thing about well, when the team is hot going into the postseason, it can make a difference. Well, I think that does have some merit, Jay. I think that's more true of your sports, where you're going to have ba- basketball, baseball, multi-game series, chemistry, playing at the right moment, being healthy. In football, man, like having the rest, especially now that it's only one team, I just think it's I just think it's vital. I mean, we're talking about um, you know an eighteen week season, seventeen games, and uh, and being that one seed. Look, it's one versus one, and I don't think it's just because they had the best record in each league. I think getting that week of rest is is really important and. You know, Phillies, uh, somebody was talking to me the other day, like, oh, you, you think they're going to pull out a bunch of trick plays? I'm like, no. 
I don't think you can see it. This is not Doug Peterson. You know, Sirianni's not doing anything that is uh, aesthetically incredible to watch. Now, anytime a Holmes plays, they do. Like, he wants to lean on the defense. They've got a great defensive line, and he wants to run the football. Like, he doesn't want this to turn into a shootout, whereas the Chiefs would have no problem with this turning into a shootout. Yeah, you're right. I was about to say the thing that Philadelphia does, really, unlike a lot of Super Bowl teams in the past few years, they can run the football, and and they they probably have the best running game in the NFL. So, um, yeah, I, I look. I think Philly wins the game. I will. Um, I will root for. Uh, I will root for the Chiefs. Um, but I, I. I just. I just don't care that much. I think. I appreciate. Jalen Hurts. Oh, I do too. You know to. To get replaced in a championship game. To come back the very next year as a backup. To then go in and help them win a playoff game. To then go somewhere else because you got one year left. To be a Heisman candidate in multiple places. To get into the college football playoff again. But you were at Bama, then you get replaced. You're a Heisman candidate at Oklahoma, but, you know, I I don't think you can do it in the pros. You don't go in the first round. You come in as a backup. You replace the guy, then you get replaced again. And I don't know if you know some of it comes from his his dad. His dad is a coach, and I think that I think that helps with his mindset. <clears throat> I mean, Jay, we talk about it. We're for the transfer rule, and I think for for some young men, it's it's good form. They want to go somewhere and play. But for others, the reality is, it is sort of a way out of. Well, it's not working out for me right now, so I just want to jump ship. I'm not saying it's one thing across the board. The fact that Jalen, everyone says, oh, he jumped ship. No, he didn't jump ship. He he came back to Bama the next year. And the guy has been uber talented and doubted a lot as far as can he actually, he's really good, but can he actually do the best thing? Now he's in the Super Bowl, man. And so I, I'm not an Eagles fan per se, but I I respect the heck out of Jalen Hurts' oh, I journey. I, I I agree with that. Um Got a uh, got a text uh, from Kent. Said I was telling my college student son about the newspapers, talking about the days at Blackham. College students today don't know where to get a newspaper. And um, Craig says that he's still upset that we never played that stupid "Room Without a Roof" song. He's talking about. Happy by Pharrell, a song that he hates. That's oh, a great song. No, it is. It's, it is gonna, a great song. I'm going to play that on terrible exactly, Tuesday, Craig? exactly. And now what Craig, what's wrong with you? You know, sometimes all of Craig's taste is in his mouth. What? Unless he has COVID. Um, um, but he, you know, now he's very good at um, selecting bourbon. He's he's good at that. Right, he's made you a bourbon like connoisseur. Uh, I don't know about connoisseur, but he certainly oh, made no, me a fan of it. He has. You, you come in here talking about all these bourbons, and I'm like, I don't know what any of that is. I just know it's bourbon. I don't know all the differences. You, you need to drink more. Yeah, I, I I don't know that that's necessarily what I need to do, Jay. I'll be <laughs> honest with you. Uh, one listener uh, chimes in he, uh, on Twitter. He DM me. He said, I added Liquor and Horse to my playlist because of y'all. Thanks so much for introducing this and so many other terrible songs to me. You're very welcome. Yes. You're very welcome. And thank you for uh, for listening. Uh, we got a couple minutes left here. Jay, I want to thank you, brother, for all you've done for me, for uh, bringing me in on your show. Shoot, 2005? You're like, oh, this this young guy's kind of annoying. Let me uh, Let me see if he wants to come on with me for an hour. And you let me start hosting your show, which as much as you travel with a team, it was, gosh, it was, it was a lot. And, um, you know, I really cut my teeth doing those, those four hours at three hours. And, um, you know, the, the formats changed a lot in that time, but, uh, I came here and Steve hired me and it was five seventy five an hour. Hey, but the promise was, Hey, we'll let you get on the air. Which was kind of silly on Steve's part. I mean, he didn't he didn't know if I was going to get on and just be terrible. But you know, he trusted me, interviewed me, and uh, and then from there, you know, I was able to get a show and be here as long as I have. And um, you know, I I feel blessed to be able to go out on my own terms. And I wish that many others could do the same. But uh, certainly, you know, I, 
I hope this doesn't come across the wrong way. But uh, a lot of times people will be like, oh, you're, you're mentor Jay. You're mentor Jay. And I, I, don't, I don't disregard that. I think you helped me a lot when I started. But people were still saying that like 10 years in. I'm like, <laughs> I, I, I uh, hello, I, I, I think I can do this by myself that, now. N- that's, that's, not, that's, that's not what I mean by it. I wasn't, I wasn't offended by it. But I think the point I'm getting at is I think it was a mentorship for a little while, but it became a friendship pretty early yeah. on where yeah, the did. barrier of, okay, you, you, you've been here for a while and you're in, you're in charge. And like that, that there was that period of time, but it wasn't very long. And that's not because I suddenly was great or anything. It was just because we became friends despite, despite the gap in age, despite, you know, the fact that you were, you know, the Dean of Acadia in a sports talk. And I was, Probably took little Scotty <laughs> a little you know I used to I think we both used to take ourselves a bit more serious um I know I used to or I used to attach my identity a little bit to this which I I haven't done in a long time um but you know you put up with me at a time where I'm sure uh my energy was a lot to handle and I just appreciate you know, everything you've done for I, me uh, okay sh- shut up <laughs> um I'm, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna say this okay there have been a couple of folks where you've got the age gap and all of that other stuff. And, and honest to God, it was really hard to do a radio show with them um, for, you know, a lot of different reasons. From the day you got here, it was never that way. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't – look, I'm almost 30 years older than you are. This should not have worked, especially at the beginning. It should not have worked. I should have been going into Grimsley and saying – why do I have to put this guy on the radio with me? That's that's what should have happened. Yeah. But it didn't. It it clicked early and I think part of it is how seriously you took it from the beginning. You wanted to be really good. It was never about your ego, which it is with a lot of young announcers. And you know, there was just there was just something that um, that made it work, and it made it work from the get. And I, you know, it shouldn't have. It shouldn't have worked, but it did, and it did. I think because you always had a maturity that was past your chronological age, or as Tony used to say, chronological age, um, <laughs> and. I I never looked at you, except when we would talk about stuff and you'd say, yeah, I don't know anything about that, okay, because you weren't born or whatever. Yeah. Um, I never looked at you as someone who was a kid because yeah. the day you got here, you weren't a kid. You were fresh out of college, but you weren't a kid. I was 23 when I started. Here. Yes, I know. And um, the fact that it clicked, I think, is credit to you. Um, more than anything else, because like I said, you took it seriously and you came in with a certain maturity. I, these last 18 years have been special to me. And, um, I don't know what the hell I'm going to do next Tuesday. (laughs) (laughs) Um, and I'm, um, you know, I'm, Somebody somebody asked me after I was no longer here full time, they say, do you miss being on the radio? And I said, no, not really. I said, and part of that is because I still get to go in and hang out with Scott uh, once a week. We're going to find we're about to find out how much I miss being on the radio. We're about to find out. And it's it, and it's going to be a little more difficult than it was three years ago because you made you you made the transition easy. So thank you. I love you. And uh, I'm going to come knock on your door one day and ask if I can play with your kids. Anytime. You know that door is always open, man. I love you too. It's been fun. You were a part of every day of my life for a long period of time. I, I saw you more than anyone, and then I got married, and I saw you more than anyone other than my wife. And then I had kids, but you were there for, uh, shoot, you were there when I got married. You were there when I had my first kid. And, you know, uh, when COVID hit, that was tough. That was really the toughest thing, honestly. 
was uh, not being able to see you all the time and have that show. But uh, once you started coming back on on Tuesdays, it it filled that that void a little bit. So it's it's been fun, man. I don't know if I can say this. Um, when COVID hit and it all came down, and um, that email was going out that day, our general manager offered to call me and break the news that I wasn't going to be on the radio anymore. And you said, no, he's going to hear it from me and he's going to hear it face to face. I always respected you, Scott, but you handled your business like a grown ass man. And I'll never forget that. Love you, brother. Love you too. All right. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow morning. The Dan Patrick Show is next.